Good evening, good evening, good evening. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our midweek gospel explosion pastoral teaching. Certainly, we thank God for you sharing your time with us on today. Yes, I am back from a little R&R uh, for the last couple of weeks. And certainly, I thank those who uh, stepped in for me while I was gone. Uh, got some rest and relaxation. Thank God for that because I had been like 15 months straight. And uh, prior to that, it was like 12, 13 months straight. So every once in a while, we need a little rest and relaxation. Again, welcome to our Gospel Explosion Wednesday night uh, pastoral teaching. Certainly, we thank you for sharing with us uh, on tonight. Well, before I get into the message tonight, I want to talk about something that has been on social media for the last uh, few days. And that is in regards to the tithe. And for some reason, it seems like many uh, in Christendom uh, are confused about whether tithing is biblical in the Bible, whether it is not, or whether we should be uh, following uh, the, the standard of tithing. Um, so hopefully I can help you for the next couple of minutes to understand that. Uh, the, the tithe was prior to the law. Certainly it was. And the, the tithe was the standard or rule of how we should give, give of our possessions, give of what we have earned. And I believe not because someone who have been internationally known or who is a television a pastor or evangelist to say that tithing is not biblical then or tithing is not in the New Testament. That is not true because tithing is in the New Testament. If you read Matthew 5 and 20 or Matthew 23 and 23, you can see that Jesus addressed the issue. Question asked, why did he address this issue more often? Well, because that wasn't an issue uh, in those days, uh, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, they didn't believe much about Jesus, but they believe in giving at least a tenth of their earnings. So I'm going to turn with me very quickly to Matthew chapter 5 and verse uh, 20. Matthew 5 and verse 20. And I'm going to read this a little quickly because I want to get into the word or uh, to the message tonight. But I think this needs to be known. Uh, because many are upset about what has been said. And I don't know whether this person said it or not, but it has hit social media. So I want to address this issue. Verse Matthew 5 and 20 says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of God. Now, the Pharisees and the Pharisees, they gave their time. Here, Jesus said, if your righteousness don't exceed, go beyond what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. He says that you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Jesus said. Now, let's go. Let's back up a few verses to verse 17. Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, although tithing was before the law. He came to fulfill, fulfill what? To fulfill the law or make it stronger. And he did that. All right, let's go to Matthew 23 and 23. <clears throat> Matthew 23 and 23 says something like this. Jesus is speaking again. And regardless of whoever speaks, I'm going to believe what Jesus speaks. Matthew 23 and 23. Listen what he says. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe, tenth of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. That is judgment, mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done. Now watch this last clause and not to leave the other undone. Did you get that? Now, as I conclude on this little tidbit about tithing, if anyone, any one of us, whether we're preachers, teachers, or whatever we call ourselves, 
if we have been teaching our people to give tithe, have we been doing that so our people could be blessed? Or have we been doing that so we can get our personal blessings? When I teach on giving, when I teach on tithe and offering, I teach that so the people of God, the people whom I'm teaching will be blessed. Not for me, because I believe God is going to bless me if I do what he says anyway. So when I teach on tithing or giving, tithing and offering, I'm teaching so they can be blessed. Because that's what it says in the word. If you give what God has asked you to give, then you will be blessed. Now, if there was no standard, if there was no rule of how much of how how we should give, then how would we know what to give? Tithing to me just simplifies, and tithing really is the basement of our giving. It simplifies that we can all give equally from what we have possessed. We give a tenth. If I'm making five hundred dollars a week, I give a tenth. If I'm earning five hundred dollars a week, I give a tenth. If you earn a hundred dollars a week, you give a tenth. So you have given just as much as me. As given the tenth, or you have followed the rule by just giving your tenth, just like I gave my tenth. Now, one more thing: the lady that Jesus was when he was in the temple sitting and watching, and the lady with the, the mites, <clears throat> and gave her two mites, and Jesus said she had given more than those who gave out their abundance. Why? Because this lady gave a hundred percent. She gave all that she had. Others was giving out of their abundance. And Jesus said, this lady has given more, although she only gave two mites. So my brothers and sisters, don't let things that come from people, regardless of how, how advanced, how, how, how popular they are, to deter you from what the word says. Read the word, study the word, so you would know what thus says the Lord. Because I believe that a lot of times people get so high in themselves and then because they change their belief, then they want you to change what you believe. So much for that. Thank you for listening. Now, in the last few weeks before I, before I went on leave, I went on vacation, we was talking about faith and we was talking about the God kind of faith. That was our general theme. And our subtopic was fight, the faith fight. And so we, we, we talked part one and part two of fight the faith fight. And so tonight we're going to part three of fight the faith fight. Now it's, 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 it's so amazing how God had me to teach on this because now from hearing some of the things that you've heard or even some of the things that you've seen in the last month or so really cause you to understand how important it is to have faith in God and to fight the faith fight and stop trying to fight people and things and places, etc. So our, our, our subject tonight is part three of fight the faith fight. And uh, our text is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, and St. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. So I'm going to read uh, 1 Timothy first, and then we'll kind of bring you up to date. I'm going to do it a little quickly, uh, so hang in there with me. 1 Timothy 6 and 12 says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, <clears throat> whereunto thou art also called and has professed, or confess, a good profession, a confession before many witnesses. St. James chapter 2, <clears throat> begin, at, begin reading at verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be Naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warm and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? Verse 17. If so, faith, if it has not works, 
is dead being alone. So we're talking about fight, <clears throat> fight the faith fight, part, part three. Well, to bring you up to date, uh, in the last two um, uh, sessions, we talked about faith and we mentioned the fact that faith is a lifestyle, not a trend or a fad. We are to fight the good fight of faith. Faith is conviction or persuasion, which means belief, plus corresponding action. James chapter 2, what I just read, verse 14 through 17, expresses and explains that. Faith has a vital principle. Faith speaks what it believes. That's the vital principle of faith. Faith speaks what it believes. <clears throat> Faith speaks what God says and change. When you speak what God says, it changes your situations and circumstances. When we as children of God speak what God says, it will change our situation and circumstances. Faith. The second thing we want you to remember we talked about is faith has nothing to do with emotions. Faith is outside the realm of emotions. Faith is not just believing. It is an act that corresponds or an action that answers back what you say. It is that you believe. I'm just bringing you up to date. So speaking is the primary act of faith. We believe it and put some action to it by doing what? By speaking what we say we believe. In the same way, faith is not an emotion. Fear is not an emotion. And fear and faith is on the same rope. But one is on one end and one is on the other. But you must remember that fear also is not an emotion. Fear is faith in the wrong set of realities. Fear is faith in your negative reinforcement. Fear is faith in your opinion. Are you hearing me? Faith is an action. So is fear. The vital principle of fear. Don't miss this. The vital principle of fear is it is not fear until you speak it, until it comes out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. You can still have the promise if you don't allow your thinking, if you don't allow your thinking, the things that you think about, if you don't allow your crazy thinking to come out, of your mouth, you can still have those things that God has promised you. Just brought you up to date. So tonight is part two. Part two, fight the faith fight. Now, in Matthew's uh, gospel, Matthew's chapter eight, verse 23 through 26. Let's turn there for a moment, if you will. Matthew eight, 23 through 26. Listen what is recorded. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, talking about Jesus. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Jesus was sleeping. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. You see that? Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, why are you fearful? Now we just got through talking about fear. O ye of little faith, then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Now listen very carefully. Because we... I'm going to shine some light on this text. We've heard this text preached, taught many times. I'm sure if you've been in Christendom any length of time. 
I want you to understand that in this text, Jesus Christ was asleep. That's what the text says. He was not conscious of what was happening around him. He was asleep. He was asleep in the ship in a storm. Uh-huh. Now, he was no more conscious of what was going on in the earth realm than you and I are when we are asleep. In other words, <coughs> excuse me, he was not picking something up in the spirit while he was asleep. Remember, Jesus was 100% human. And he was 100% divine. At this point, the humanity of Jesus had set in. He was tired because if you read scripture prior to that, he had done some great ministering to the people. So he was asleep. At this particular time, he was not conscious of where they were either emotionally or spiritually. Because the human Jesus Christ was asleep. Are you hearing me? Uh-huh. But, watch this. When they woke him up, they said unto him, Lord, save us. We are perishing. You see that? Now, when they said that, that is all Jesus heard. And Jesus looked at them and responded by saying, why are ye fearful? In essence, Jesus the Christ said, said that what they said to him was a statement of fear. I say that again, so I want you to get it. Jesus said, that what they said to him was a statement of fear. Not a statement of faith, but a statement of fear. Now, he was not sensing fear when he was asleep. Jesus knew they were afraid. Why? Because of what they said. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. He knew that they were fearful because of what they said. Mm -hmm. His disciples, many of them, and perhaps most of them, were fishermen. Uh -huh. They lived by the sea and were accustomed to waves and motion. They, they knew that any storm like the one they were in would put them in jeopardy of death. They knew that. They were experienced men of the sea, most of them. Mm -hmm. They had probably seen that kind of storm before. And their experience told them that kind of storm could kill them. In other words, they believed their circumstances that the storm would kill them. So what did they do? So when they, they woke up Jesus and when they woke Jesus for him to address their situation, he responded in verse 26. He responded and guess how he responded? He responded by saying, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? That means to me that you can't have faith in God and fear at the same time. I just threw that in. It ain't cost you anything. 
Listen. In other words, you choose which one to use. You and I, as Christians, in the midst of all that's going on in our world today, we can choose to have faith in God or be fearful or be afraid. And many of us in Christendom are running scared because we are afraid. Listen, your faith perhaps is little because you have not been exercising it. And if you exercise it, then you will not have to wake up God for everything. Are you hearing me? Hmm. You see, your mind, and you know your mind will play tricks on you. Your mind will tell you, or your mind may be telling you, all manner of things in your current situations. And listen, hear this. Just because, just because you are feeling anxiety about the move God is telling you to make does not mean that you are in fear. Did you get that? In the same way that your belief alone about something does not mean you are in faith. Because we know that belief and faith is different. You need belief, but belief is, belief is not faith. Faith is belief or conviction or persuasion plus corresponding action. That's faith. Mm -hmm. Listen, your belief alone in something negative does not mean you are in fear. It is not fear until it comes out of your mouth. That's the vital principle of fear. It's not fear until you speak it. Wow. That's good news for somebody right there. However, listen carefully. If you believe that you are in fear, then you will not walk in faith. Did you get that? Got some backup. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Familiar passage of scripture, but there's something in there you can get tonight if you just listen carefully. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship into the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, or Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him or begged him earnestly. Greatly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she might be healed and she shall live. That's what Jairus said. Are you with me so far? Uh-huh. Now we'll stop right there for a moment. <clears throat> now, this was an old covenant because the new covenant was not in effect until after the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Jairus was speaking forward to the cross, but it was a statement of faith according to his covenant. Notice now, Jairus made his statement of faith by saying, the last clause of verse 23, and she shall live. You see that? Now, 
So what happens now, Jesus went with him or went with him after, <coughs> excuse me, after he had made this statement of faith. In other words, when he spoke his faith, the power of God went with him. Why do I say that? Well, because Jesus, the Christ, y'all do know him, right? Is the living word. And the power of God went with him when he spoke. The, when he spoke faith into his situation. He said in verse 23, the last clause, and she shall live. That's what Jairus said. Mm -hmm. So, the word of God went to work. The word started moving in his circumstance because of the statement of his faith. Now let's look at the next verse, verse 24. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. A great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, watch this. At this point, Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. Listen to what happened next. The next verse, verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better but rather grew worse. No better, but she got worse. You see that? Mm -hmm. You know the story. Many of us have read the story or heard the story. You can read the few verses after that. Listen. This lady with an issue of blood, she was hemorrhaging, she was bleeding. She heard of Jesus and she was healed when she was healed when she touched his garment when he when she touched his garment then Jesus the Christ asked who is who it was that touched him are you getting this the Bible declares that she told him all that happened and when she told him all that happened, Jesus responded by saying this, verse 34. So you got to read down from verse 25 to 34. I'll let you read that in your leisure time. But let's look at verse 34. After she had told him what had happened, then Jesus said unto her, verse 34, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Daughter, in this context of the text, it means uh, uh, that he's really honoring her. Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Notice now, Jesus the Christ did not say, my power has made you whole. He didn't say that, but your faith has made you whole. You see, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus knew that his power had always been there. But it was not until someone's conviction or persuasion or someone, someone's belief plus corresponding action pulled on his power that something happened. I hope you're getting this. It was not Jesus' anointing that healed her. It was her conviction or persuasion, which means belief, plus corresponding action. She went to where she heard Jesus was and she pressed her way or she, she moved through the crowd to get to him. Action. Listen. Continuing in this text, the writer again addresses Jairus' situation in the next verse, verse 35. 
Listen what he says. When he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, didn't even give him a name, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troubleth thou the master any further? Wow. Listen, 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 look at that verse again. While he yet spake, while Jesus was speaking and saying to the woman of the issue of blood that your faith has made you whole, here comes a servant of the ruler's house or the ruler's synagogue and told his master, told Jairus, your daughter's dead, so why trouble Jesus, the Christ, any further? Wow, hang on, because there's something very, very important right here. Listen carefully. I don't want you to miss this point. The word of God was already moving toward Jairus' circumstance. So then, Jairus was literally walking with the word. He's walking with Christ, who is the word. And while the word was moving in Jairus' situation, a negative report came to him that told him not to trouble the master or the teacher any further. Let me take a sidebar right here. You got to be careful who you have in your house. You got to be careful who you have in your surroundings because a lot of times they will cause you to miss your breakthrough, your blessing. This person was one of Jairus' servants told him, don't trouble the master anymore because your daughter is dead. Wow. Now let's look at verse 36. Here it is. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, spoken by who? The one that came from Jairus' house. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler, he said unto Jairus, be not afraid, only believe. Wow. Jesus said that because he, he knew Jairus was already, he already had faith because he had put action to what he believed. So Jesus said, you know, don't, don't get this twisted, Jairus. Don't get it twisted. The key word there in that verse is be not afraid. Wow. Whatever you do, do not fear. Why would Jesus tell Jairus not to fear? Why does he tell us not to be afraid or not to fear? He told Jairus that because he was walking, Jairus was walking with Jesus. He's walking with the word. The word was already moving toward his situation because of his confession of faith in verse 23. His confession of faith is, Lord, I want you to lay hands on her that she might be healed and she shall live. That's the confession of faith. Wow. Now, he told him not to fear. And my one of my points right here is, is that fear is really not an emotion, just like faith is not an emotion. Because if anyone of us who has children and someone told us that our child has died, 
we're going to show some kind of emotion. Mm -hmm. Yes, death will cause emotional response within us. But Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. So that means to me that fear or afraid is not an emotion. You see, if fear was an emotion, Jesus the Christ would not have said that to him. Why? Because it is impossible to hear that your child is dead and not have an emotional reaction. So what was Jesus doing? What was he telling him? Well, he was not telling Jairus not to have any emotion. He was telling him not to let his emotion, watch this, change his confession. Oh, y'all, did y'all get that? Don't let your emotions change your confession. Jairus had already confessed that she shall live in verse 23. So Jesus said, don't be afraid and don't let fear change your confession. Jesus was literally saying, I believe if you, if, if, if you speak what they just said, then I'm not going to your house. Jesus was going to Jairus' house because of Jairus' confession, because of Jairus' belief and his corresponding action. Jesus was saying, I believe I am walking with you right now because of what you said. And if you change what you say, then I will not be able to walk with you. Wow. See, we got to know how to utilize our faith. We got to understand how powerful faith in God is. But it's not just belief. It's conviction or persuasion or belief plus corresponding action. In other words, Jesus was literally telling Jairus, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in the court of heaven. Wow. Are y'all hearing me? I'm sure Jairus, probably like most of us, Wanted to talk. But Jesus said, be quiet and let me do what I do. Be quiet, Jairus, and let me do this. You see, the word, who is Jesus the Christ, was on its way to Jairus' house. The fact of the matter is, Jairus said nothing for the rest of the walk. That was good news for Jairus. Why? Because he said nothing else. Jairus was still walking with his confession, which was and she shall live. You see, my brothers and sisters, right there, Jesus the Christ wanted Jairus to understand that if he was to speak the report that he heard from the servant of the synagogue, of Jairus' servant. If he was to speak what he heard from 
that report, then he would have released fear in his situation. He would have released fear in his situation instead of faith. My brothers and my sisters, believe this. It is a matter of what comes out of your mouth. And many in Christendom are speaking fear out of their mouths. And remember, the vital principle is, of fear is fear is not fear until you speak it. Fear is not fear until it comes out of your mouth. When it hit the atmosphere, then it becomes. As long as you're thinking about it, it's not fear. But once you say it, it's fear. Listen. The truth is that if you don't get the word of God in your mouth, then you have no other choice but to speak your circumstances, your situations, and God calls that fear. The word of God calls that fear. So it's Fear or faith? It is your choice. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. We thank you for allowing us this privilege and this opportunity to come together on today. And we thank you for the word that you have spoken through this, your vessel. We pray now, God, that this word will be receptive that we will receive this word in the name of Jesus, that it will become part of our daily lives. We thank you now for being our God, sovereign and supreme head of our lives in the center of our joy. And we pray now, God, that you would remind us of who we are and whose we are. That you are, that we are the call out ones. We are the ecclesia. We are the body of Christ. We are your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece or mouthpieces to speak to a dying and decaying world. We pray that you give us strength and the power to operate as you have so desired and so commanded. We pray for the church that we will be strengthened as we go forward and as we go forth and that we will hold our light high so someone can see you within us. Pray for those who perhaps are backslidden, those who have walked away from your presence. We pray that they'll make a return. We pray for those who are ungodly, unsaved, that they will make a decision to come in and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior so they can operate in kingdom work. We thank you, God, for all you have done, what you are doing, and what you are going to do. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you're listening or watching tonight and you are not saved, we want to take a moment to give you an opportunity to be saved. The Bible says if you believe in the heart, in your heart, confess with your mouth, you are saved. They he who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's not a whole lot you have to do because God has already done it through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The main thing you have to do is to believe it and receive it. So if you're not saved, I would ask that you pray this prayer with me on tonight because God in heaven wants you to be saved and so do I. If you pray this prayer with me or repeat after me, Lord God, I'm a sinner I need to be saved. I need the gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sins and you raised him for my redemption. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and make me a new creature, a new creation. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. If you prayed that prayer on tonight, 
according to the word of God, you are saved. That's your first step in being Christ-like or being a Christian. Your next step, I want to encourage you to make sure that you connect with a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church so that you can learn and grow in what you have just confessed and just believed. And if you have backslidden, you need to come back, come back to the Lord, come back to the Lord Jesus Christ, come back to the triune God who loves you in spite of you. Then I want to encourage you to do that today. Don't put it off because the next minute is not promised to you. So do it today. He's waiting on you to return unto him. My brothers and sisters, thank you so much for sharing your time with us on tonight as we continue our series of messages from the theme, God kind of faith. Faith move mountains. Faith can move anything, but faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith also is belief plus corresponding action, conviction or persuasion plus corresponding action. Faith speaks what it believes. On the other end of the rope of the spectrum is fear. It is not fear until it comes out of your mouth. So stop speaking fear and begin to speak faith because faith moves the hand of God. Until Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m., we'll see you then at the sanctuary or you can join us on Facebook Live Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m. for our Sunday morning worship experience. If you're going to come to the sanctuary, 2150 Bellevue Way in the capital city of Florida, Tallahassee, Bellevue Way, 2150 Bellevue Way. We'll see you then. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, and be blessed. Certainly is our prayer.